Um, yes, yeah, so you're here to um, watch and listen to uh, They're All Going to Laugh at You, an exploration of the gender of death, emotion, and the final girl by our speaker, Taryn O'Reilly. Let me tell you a little bit about Taryn. Um, so Taryn O'Reilly is a queer American artist living and practicing around Southeast London. She has received her master's in fine art through Goldsmith in London and BFA through Arcadia University outside of Philadelphia. Interested in the ideolo ideologies of the monstrous feminine and lifelong horror fan, Taryn's practice and research is centered around exploring our conceptions of queerness, sexuality, and femininity through the use of dark humor, macabre, and camp aesthetic. So, um, yeah, take it away, Taryn. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. This really means a lot. I'm really excited to talk about all this stuff. And honestly, I could probably ramble on about it for ages. Um, but I'm just going to probably start off um, just wanting to like address a couple of things before I do the talk. Um, I want to start off by acknowledging that the primary focus of this talk will be centered around mainstream images of Western Christian iconography and women in horror films. While I regret this ge geographical limitation, um, I chose these films and these pieces of art because I find the representations to be so intrinsic intrinsically linked to each other. Um, however, both art history and classic horror films have traditionally been heavily whitewashed. Um, and I do believe that art and other forms of media act as a reflection of the social structure in which it was made. And as we discuss the socio-political climates of the decades in which these pieces were created, I find the extreme lack of diversity be incredibly telling. Um, and I also wanted to say that um, this is my interpretation of the research that I've been doing for the past three years um, for my own practice. And I have a lot of thoughts surrounding identity and queerness in both death iconography and horror films. But for now, I'm gonna be focusing on um, the representations of femininity and horror. Um, I also wanna give a brief trigger warning because I'll be talking about um, imagery surrounding uh, trauma and rape. So I just wanted to let everybody know. Um, okay, we can get started. Um, I think it's best to start with the art history first and gradually move through into the Bride of Frankenstein Carry in Midsummer so that we can better make connections between art and film. Um, so I'm just gonna jump into it. <laughs> Uh, the personification of death throughout our history is relatively diverse. The depiction ebbs and flows between the binary genders, and in some cases, death isn't even gendered at all. Uh, this can depend on a couple of things. Grammatically, gendered languages typically depicted death as either male or female, depending on the masculine or feminine ending of the word for death. Um, and without the influence of art and religion, uh, without the influence of religion, art and literature would typically portray death as a genderless skeleton in a black robe. Um, so by many accounts, death is either a nurse, a lover, or even a friend. Or my personal favorite, uh, he's a gardener, which is the little one down at the bottom there. Um, and he's just living the dream. Um, uh, in other cases, uh, the way death is represented is dependent on the type of society that death is representing. Um, so there's a quote here from the book that I uh, was reading called The Gender of Death. Um, and death will be seen as masculine or feminine according to whether it typically occurs in phallic penetrating or vaginal envelope in form. Thus, in a hunting society or a martial one, death is most likely to occur in the form of some kind of wounding or tearing, whether by the goring, clawing, or trampling of beasts, or by the weapons of man. Such events will tend to be associated with masculinity and with paternal strength and power. In agricultural or peasant society, death is apt to come from starvation and disease and hence to be experienced as an envelopment and associated with maternal deprivation. There's a ton of images um, of death being this kind of heroic knight or the captain of an army and things like that. And they were almost always seen as men. Um, which probably brings us to the Middle Ages. Um, We'll just start off there, uh, just because I think the representation of death is so interesting and really badass. Just <laughs> um, so the Middle Ages is quite the broad length of time, but um, death fluctuates between binary genders throughout it all. Um, at this point in time, there's no separation between science and religion if scientific method is used at all. Therefore, it was believed that those who died did so because they were sinners um, and they were being punished in the hands of an angry God. Using the allegory of Adam and Eve, the gender of death was based on who took the blame for the fall of man. Um, essentially, Adam and Eve were the first to deny the, 
defy the laws of God and indulge themselves in the apples from the tree of knowledge. Um, Eve being tempted by Satan is the first to bite. And because of her defiance, humanity is punished with the burden of mortality. This in turn makes it so that death, sin, carnal desire, and Eve were fused to the point where one could allegorically stand for the other. In the same era, the Black Plague was tearing through Europe with a vengeance. Um, it ruthlessly wiped out villages with no class, gender, or age discrimination. Thus, images of Eve or death acting as one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse is born. Um, typically, these images were titled the triumph of death, um, where this feminine death was shown purging large communities of people. Um, and I don't know if you can see it here. I know there's one in the corner there, but basically they're always on top of this almost coffin-like carriage um, holding some sort of a weapon. Um, and they have long flowing hair and all the markers of what they deem would look feminine out of that era. Um, and she's trampling over the corpse, corpses she's already claimed and stabbing what was left of the living, which is cool. I mean, wildly cool, good for her. Um, <laughs> in some cases, uh, Eve and death become animal or monster hybrids. Um, so they're adorned with like the wings of a bat um, or they become a serpent. Um, they have a serpent tongue sometimes. Um, but also still with the same markers of femininity of that era in order to show the viewer that the bringer of death is in fact female. Um, the parts the author or the artist choose to specifically use for are to prove her own monstrosity, basically, like a grotesque corpse bride that encapsulates the fear of, of, of a defiant woman. Um, so that's gonna bring us into the Renaissance, Renaissance and Baroque period. I'm trying to like, just with time and stuff like that, I wish I could get into more of it because it, it is all so fascinating. Um, but it's here that death switches roles and becomes the manifestation of Adam. Um, these are what are known as the death and the maiden motifs. So you can see some of these images here. Um, departing from the Garden of Eden and focusing on who gets to enter heaven or hell, these images were a result of two consequences of the fall, death and sex sexuality, and they become inexplicably linked. Um, so you can see in some of these uh, images here, they're both done by the same painter, um, but death is basically groping a woman that doesn't is kind of like letting him there's like this idea of like eve is technically coy um and you don't know if she wants it or not and i think that really is telling for the time of how they pretty much how they portrayed women um in that era or how they felt towards women um in the more crass versions of the death and the maiden um she's always youthful docile um plump cheeks um, and her expression is usually quite blank. Um, but then as that kind of progresses and you have more like lewd versions of this Death and the Maiden, it becomes a little bit more horrific. Um, in this case, in my mind, death isn't a lover, he is a, an aggressor. Um, using all the elements of a typical memento mori painting, um, death with his hourglass and dead flowers in one hand sneaks up behind his unsuspecting victim and grabs her with the other. Um, in some cases, she's sleeping. In other cases, it's completely, he's like behind a veil um, or he's always hidden. Um, it is here that he crudely assaults and torments his victims rather than seducing them. Um, you can see it in these particular paintings, the one on either side. Um, oh, hold on. I'm sorry, that wasn't true the thought. <laughs> Um, you can see that these, both of these depictions of Eve, um, she's crying and pleading and showing emotion, which unlike the other ones from the last slide, you can't really see her. She's not really showing much emotion and they're pretty docile, um, which is quite rare to show women looking like this in the era. Um, so it's what I kind of take the idea of it as being um, Adam taking the bite of the proverbial apple in that one picture with him biting her cheek. Um, so when you're looking at the politics of this era, um, I read these as images of Eve still being punished for her transgression and in turn warn a warning to women everywhere. Um, with that being said, I think it actually is kind of important to indulge in what was going on in the era because it's not really written a lot about. 
Um, and I've only found like one or two sources that um, can confirm this. Um, but basically, during the 15 and 1600s, there was a wave of, of what they considered, it wouldn't be even considered feminism at the time, but female oh. artists and writers were emphasizing mythological stories empowered by women known as the nine women of Worthy. These were tales of women who were either warriors leading armies, women overcoming tremendous amounts of abuse, or women whose intellects were unmatched all of which were placed in what were traditionally considered masculine roles. Female activists in, involved in the movement used their abilities to counter the treatment of women of that era and strive to reconcile the struggle between femininity and ambition. Not surprisingly, there was an extreme pushback from their male counterparts, making these nine women worthy objects of sexual desire was one way of asserting male dominance, and another was rendering them with youthful, docile faces, pursed lips, and a delicate posture. In conjunction with this political activism, <clears throat> socially, it was actually considered unladylike to portray a woman with her mouth open. Um, so it would, um, any form of, act, of smiling, laughing, crying, screaming, were believed to make women susceptible to uncertain evils possessing them. Those portrayed in this manner were considered devious, diabolical, and above all else, dangerous. Um, the women allowed to smile were the ones that were well known to be chased um, because they had nothing to fear really. This is evident in the frequent portrayals of the Virgin Mary smiling down at her son. Um, and I put these images up because I didn't want to use, at the same period of time, there were a lot of images that were really popular called heroic rape scenes. And I honestly didn't really want to give that kind of any time of day right now. Um, but I thought these were like a really good example of the differences and how um, those how women are portrayed in both stories. Um, both sets of paintings are of a mythological or biblical story depicting the torment of, of the female protagonist. The painter um, Artisma portrays not just the accurate emotions involved in the artists of Suzanne and the elders, but also represents feminine rage in a time where this was not only unheard of, but deeply unfavorable. Women portraying themselves with their mouth open becomes an act of rebellion. So you can see in both these images, um, Judith slaying Holofernes and uh, the Carvaggio and the Artesmia version, what, what a vast difference. In Carvaggio, she just looks completely unsure of herself. She's young. Whereas the other one, she knows what she's going to do. Um, so I thought, I think that that's kind of important to understand why the Renaissance era depicted women in that way. This was just what was popular and it was just unheard of to just show a woman sm uh, smiling at all. Actually, there's a, I found a review. The reason why the Mona Lisa was so, um, uh, so famous now is because at the time it actually caused a lot of controversy. Um, the fact that she's smirking in that image and no one knew who she was outraged people of that era. And there was like a review of it somewhere. Um, I wish I pulled that quote, um, but it was crazy. They were, it was basically just saying like, how dare she? <clears throat> um, and that's why it was, it's kind of been still stuck in our art history, like our psyche of art history. It's very weird. Um, another strong example of this distortion of female emotion as it coincides with death are the many, many, many portraits of Medusa. Her image has fluctuated between the feminine and the horrific and her story is the same. Some have been emphasized the fact that she was a victim of sexual assault and punished for the acts beyond her control. Others have chosen to reflect on, her, on Perseus's triumph in defeating the creature, who turned men to stone just by looking at her. She's both a victim and a villain. Portraying her headless, dripping in blood with her mouth agape was just another warning to the outspoken women everywhere. Although I do believe that now, the more we look at it, some people are thinking, uh, say that Medusa is actually smiling or laughing. Um, so there's a, a bit of a difference in the way Medusa is viewed now, which I think is really beautiful. Um, I'm going to skip the Romantic era because death is a friend there, which is quite lovely, but um, I'm going to skip to the decadence. So uh, we're going to begin to see the personification of death that we're more familiar with today. Predominantly, death is female, but she is a gorgon, um, a nymph, a siren, an angel of death. But most importantly, she's the femme fatale, um, which I think is really popular in horror films. Um, it's important to know that diseases like syphilis and STIs, tuberculosis, uh, were rampant amongst communities with seemingly no class discrimination. Ergo, death is shown as the eternal temptress luring men to their death. Even when portrayed with a skeletal body, death is given stereotypical markers of a woman, such as pearls, long hair, peels, breasts. Um, the most common portrayals have been dressed in a provocative fashion, employing her feminine, 
humanoid mask away from her face, revealing to the viewer the skeletal figure beneath. In doing, show, in doing so, she becomes a ruthless, cold, and cunning character. Um, in a lot of pieces of literature, she tricks her unsuspecting gentleman to dancing with her at mass parade balls. After the dance is through and a beautiful night was to be had, she kills them anyway. In some instances, she's an ethereal bride taking her, taking her lover with her for all of eternity. Um, basically throughout it all, death is depicted, um, when death is depicted as female, she's either sexual or incredibly monstrous, um, which is kind of a dichotomy I think we see a lot in not just horror films, but in films in general and media in general. Um, I know that was a lot of information, so I hope I hope I didn't brush through it too quickly. Because <laughs> um, I'm gonna start talking about final girl theory, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, it's my belief that horror films, a lot like the death iconography that we just reviewed, are a reflection of the cultural reality of the time in which it was created. Um, I'm sure that you're a lot of really familiar with Carol J. Clover's book, um, Men, Women, and Chainsaws. And I kind of pulled some quotes from her a lot. So um, it basically refers to the last girl or woman alive to confront the killer or monster. She's the one left behind to tell the story. Um, the most used examples of this are Halloween, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Friday the 13th, and even Alien. Um, Slasher and horror films of the era generally follow the same formula as did the final girl who survived them. Many authors seem to agree that mainstream horror films made in the 70s through the early 90s were made with solely male gaze in mind. Is Clover who, suggest, who suggests that making a character a woman who outsmarts or outlives everyone else is done for a couple of reasons. First being that the demographic in this era of filmmaking was predominantly male. Um, and so giving a female actress a lot of screen time became important. However, her portrayal on screen had to be specific. Essentially, to make her too feminine would make her less credible to the male audience, and therefore they can't relate to her as a heroic character. And if you think back about what I was saying about male death, the only hero male death you've ever seen has been a male, like male army, male knight, and things like that. Um, in order to remedy this, they are designed to be more masculine, tomboyish, with understated dress, and even a genderless name. Uh, the female lead isn't necessarily male or female. In fact, she can ebb and flow between the, the binary, but never crossing the threshold of the gender entirely. Um, and my, my God, do they love a practical button up? That is, every picture I looked up, they're always in a tank top and a button up, which I love. <laughs> um, to double down on this imagery, even her weapon of choice becomes a phallic symbol of penetration. Um, another reason the victim hero trope springs up in this era um, uh, for this genre, I mean, is due to the almost sadistic and voyeuristic nature of the films. Slasher films are predictable, and so you know what you're going to get when you watch them. Uh, you don't know how it will happen, but you know that it will. The anticipation of gore and violence is what brings this audience in and keeps them connected to the killer, their victims, and the final girl herself. It's also why these films are very rarely, very rarely deviate from the formula. Essentially, just give them what they want. Um, There are many interpretations of what the final girl is and isn't um, since the introduction of the trope, but it's not always about who gets to live. It's also about those who must die in order for her to survive. Um, to have her be sexual would make it so the, the predominantly male audience couldn't sympathize with her. Uh, so the final girls are often uninterested in sex or dating. Girls who find themselves indulging on sexual urges are usually the first to die. They're always hypersexual teenagers, half nude and in vulnerable positions when the killer finds them. Perhaps this is a warning to all promiscuous women everywhere. Um, just another Eve paying for the sins of man. But they do have a couple of theories that it also, especially in the eighties, it has a lot to do with the AIDS epidemic and the way that was being portrayed in the media. Um, but that's, I can go into that later um, in like the question part if anyone wants to talk more about that. Um, Sometimes the women aren't even being promiscuous at all. Sometimes it's just their vulnerability that gets them killed. In instances, uh, they are separated. In some instances, they are separated from the rest of the group and become an unfortunate, easy target. Um, there is an author named Jack Halberstam that I really, really love. Uh, and if there's a lot of my, um, a lot of the sources that I've used actually come from some of their books. But they wrote a book called Gothic Horror and the Technology of Monsters. Um, 
And basically Jack says that the women within this genre who aren't the final girl are intentionally made to be hyper feminine with all the stereotypical markers of a woman. So with all the stereotypical markers of a woman, so does uh, the stereotype of the emotional woman. Um, the depths for the female and the sub characters are always longer than the male counter counterpart and way more gruesome. Um, this might be because women are seen as more emotional beings. So to have a feminine woman die means that she'll have a whole range of expressions to portray as she's, as she's experiencing death. Um, so she might beg or even plead for her life, giving into the state of voyeuristic fantasy of the men watching. Ultimately, it's important to understand that every final girl to ever be written is subjected to unspeakable amounts of trauma and expected to carry on. They witness the death of their friends, family, loved ones in horrifically graphic ways. Oftentimes, she becomes callous, mal malicious, or even monstrous herself in order to survive, whether that is by destroying the killer or monster themselves or waiting for an authority figure to arrive. I would even argue that killers and monsters within the genre resemble the iconography of the death and the maiden motif we saw in the Renaissance period. They stalk or lurk within the darkness waiting for their un unexpected victim, either following closely behind them while they walk along in the moonlit street, hiding in closets, or while they're sleeping, or they show up when they wipe the fog off a bathroom mirror. Um, just wanted to give a brief history of the final girl, but I think now we're gonna get into like the juicy bits of it. Um, so we're gonna start talking about the films in particular that I think that these are all kind of linked. Um, in my mind, uh, The Bride of Frankenstein is the quintessential female monster and the epitome of death in both the book and the film. I think it's important to look at her existence um, from the book Frankenstein by Mary Shelley and also by the film by James Wales in order to understand her cultural significance. She's not necessarily a final girl, but by definition, but her legacy has definitely influenced the genre. The genre. Um, so Meredith Shelley's Frankenstein tells the story of a gifted scientist, Victor Frankenstein, who succeeds in giving life to a being of his own creation. However, this is not the perfect specimen he, he imagines that it will be, but rather a hideous creature who is rejected by Victor and mankind in general. The monster seeks its revenge and through seeks his revenge through murder and terror. Overwhelmed by his loneliness and rage, the monster yearns for a female companion. Dr. Frankenstein yields to his request and begins to build a him a female partner. He realizes halfway through it that to make her into a true female companion, she would have to be fitted with the appropriate genitalia and reproductive parts. The thought of this creation disrupting or threatening the established order frightens and enrages Dr. Frankenstein. In arguably, arguably the most graphic scene of the whole novel, uh, he tears her apart limb from limb and throws her body into body parts into the ocean, never allowing to, her to come to fruition. Her body parts become the epicenter for violence, fear, and horror. Um, Jack Halberstam says in her book, um, the vision of Victor wrestling with the female flesh of the monster has the horrifying effect of a primal scene. The act of reproduction becomes here a bloody mess of dismemberment, a deconstruction of woman into her messiest and most slippery parts. While Frankenstein can stitch together a man in his own image from human and animal remains, the female monster is far too monstrous to even be allowed to exist. Um, in the film, in the 1935 James Whale, Wales version of the film, um, she's finally visualized, but not without controversy. The film follows the creation of man in, um, that occurred in 1931 from the Frankenstein film and proves that both Dr. Frankenstein and his monster have survived the burning windmill and it leads to the creation of the woman. Its plot follows the cha a chase in Dr. Frankenstein as he attempts to abandon his, plane, his plans to create life only to be tempted and finally coerced, coerced by his old mentor, Dr. Pretorius, along with threats from the monster into constructing a mate for the monster. The bride's presence in the film is incredibly brief. She only comes in in like the last three or four minutes of the film. Um, and yet the plot is centered around her possible creation. Played by um, Elsa Lancaster, she is visually stunning in her appearance and yet she does not speak a word, she can only scream. Her movements are robotic and there's an emphasis on her scars and stitches, furthering the idea that she is a put together thing, a monster to be feared. In fact, the original film was cut from 90 to 75 minutes with the omission of a grim scene in which Pretorius experiments on a live woman dis dissecting her until she awakens and screams for mercy. In fact, all of the female characters who appear in the film have brief time and barely enhance the plot. Um, there's even a scene where Mary Shelley kind of 
foreshadows what's going to happen in the book, but they kind of cut her short as well. Um, uh, we don't have much an idea of what the companion would have looked like in the book, um, but the visual portrayal of her in Wales film is particularly, particularly important. Um, it's important to know that the bride represents death, but death as a female, like, like a hybrid woman. Um, the parts of her were chosen by Dr. Frankenstein and, Petro and Pretoria specifically to only for the idea of her own monstrosity. This is not unlike the images we saw in the Middle Ages of the female personified death with the wings of a bat. Unlike that version of death, her presence isn't chaotic and evil. She is scared and vulnerable. From the start to finish, the bride's existence is marred by the men in the film focused on creating a woman in the patriarchal image. Her body is stitched and sutured together in a cold, dark castle on a cold slab with the expectation to be shocked into existence and immediately take her place next to her male counterpart. Ultimately, um, without saying a word, the bride, what? Just a minute. Um, could you uh, live, leave a little bit more time for the slides with the quotes, just so people have a bit more of a chance to read? Just yeah, yeah. For the quotes, just because uh, it's going a little fast, so. I'm sorry. I'm all, so all nervous. Good, all good. Just, through it. <laughs> yeah, just so we can get immersed in it more. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Um, ultimately, without saying a word, the bride claims her own autonomy um, at the end of the film. Through hissing and screaming, she objects her to pre she objects her predetermined path um, created by the two doctors. When looking back at the imagery of Medusa, we know that a woman screaming or shown with her mouth open becomes an act of rebellion. Um, the up-close camera angles of her shrieking and screaming becomes an act of defiance even. Despite her vulnerable position, she is empowered enough to try and save herself from whatever could come from the life she's offered. Um, in the end, enraged by yet another rejection, the monster burns down the lab with her in it, the last lines being, we belong dead. Um, from what we know of horror, it's the women who contain their emotions that tend to survive, but I think her brief acts of defiance is what makes her a cultural icon within the horror genre. Um, and you can see some of these, that picture of Medusa, the sculpture is I think from like the 1500s. Um, okay, so I'm gonna like move on to Carrie. I hope I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going too fast. I'm just excited and nervous to be talking about all this stuff. Um, it's Carrie especially, I'm really excited to talk about Carrie. Um, I could probably go on and on, um, but I'll try and keep on track just a little bit. Um, so the rendition, there's so many renditions of Carrie, and I don't know if a lot of people know this, but there was a musical with her in it, uh, well, based on Carrie, and it was a flop, uh, which is upsetting because I would love to see that. Um, there's Carrie 2, there's a Carrie's 90s version, but the ones we're probably going to focus on is the book itself. Um, the 2013 version... Uh, and a 1974 version, uh, or 1976, I'm sorry. Um, I think these have left more of a cultural impression um, in terms of like when people think of Carrie, they think of these. Um, but I guess for the, those of you that don't know the plot of Carrie, um, she is a shy girl who's outcasted from, by her peers and sheltered by her religious mother. Um, this unleashes her telekinetic terror on a small town after being pushed too far at her senior prom. Kind of like a brief overview of what it is. Um, I think when the book came out in 1974 and when the film came out in 1976, I think it's really important to understand what was going on in America at the time. Um, so this was right after the civil rights movement that happened, um, the sexual revolution that happened in the 60s and it was leading into the Vietnam War and the women's liberation movement. Um, these were massive events that culturally affected everything from literature, film, and music. It seemed, um, it's at the time, it felt like we were steamrolling into a future with the hopes of a country that would, had some equity, um, but there was a massive um, pushback by the evangelical and Republican right-wing party. Um, they genuinely feared what would come, what would become of the side of, of a society if they allowed marginalized groups of people to even have rights, which is terrible. Um, so that's kind of what's happening in the background of the, the first film in the book. Um, and even Stephen King kind of addresses that. Um, the underlying tones of Carrie in both the book and the original film absolutely reflect like that anxiety. Um, 
uh, especially surrounding the women's uh, liberation movement. Um, so Stephen King says, Carrie is large, ooh, no. It is largely about how women find their own channels of power, but also what men fear about women and women's sexuality. Writing the book in 1973 and only three years out of college, I was fully aware of what women's liberation implied for me and others of my sex. Carrie is, uh, Carrie is woman feeling her powers for the first time and Samson, like Samson pulling down the temple on everyone in sight at the end of the book. Um, I think what's really interesting about Stephen King and like his views of Carrie, even when you read the book, it's not very sensitive. Um, because you can tell that that anxiety is there, that he, he like fears the women, the women's liberation movement. Um, and he has said a lot of things like being interviewed about it, um, that he considered her, he never really saw Carrie as a female anyway. He talks a lot about how he thinks that Carrie's more like, um, um, like a boy with his shorts being pulled down in gym class or something like that. He always refers to her, he was like, this, this is a story for them. So it's never really for women actually in general. Um, um, all in all, uh, Carrie's book Clover called a victim hero. Um, as her character arc is surrounded by trauma and abuse, both from her peers and her mother, she unleashes hell on everyone. And then she meets her own demise. Uh, basically what I refer to as a good for her film. Um, um, Carrie, Carrie White's mother, Margaret, um, is a direct reflection of the extreme evangelical right anxiety and apparently Stephen King's as well. Um, the film itself, if anyone's seen the original, um, it starts off with a slow motion pan through a high school locker room uh, where young girls are bouncing around laughing and dressing after gym class. The camera is scanning the room from a first person perspective. They resemble nymphs in a painting, incredibly ethereal. Um, it is here where we reach Carrie slowly washing herself in the shower until suddenly blood begins to run down her leg. With the realization, she begins to scream, covered in her own blood, rushing to the nymphs asking for help. The perspective of Carrie, um, the perspective of the, of the camera turns from first person to the perspective of Carrie. Uh, the women who were once ethereal creatures turn to demons, hurling tampons at her and are yelling, plug it up. Um, I think the perspective change uh, that happens in that one scene is actually really important. Because um, basically to shift the particular horror associated with Carrie onto a larger female population and ultimately to foist a masculine fantasy of femininity onto the female subject. Um, so I think that scene alone really drives home Stephen King's kind of thoughts behind Carrie to begin with. Um, that it's in fact all women that are demons. Um, did I leave enough time? Is that good? <laughs> Um, yeah, it's great, thanks. Okay. Um, in both the book and the films, um, Margaret White reacts to Carrie's sudden period in the same vein. Um, and this kind of becomes the introduction to her abusive relationship with Carrie. Um, it's probably because at the time, fundamentalist Christian worldview in which menstruation is not simply a biological process, but rather evidence of Eve's original sin being visited upon her Upon her, upon her daughters. Um, so she, Margaret basically sees Carrie as Eve. Um, and there's uh, apparently a song written about it in the musical called I Am Not Eve. Um, and it's something that uh, in the 2013 Carrie, she pleads with her often at telling her that she's not Eve, even when she picks out her wedding or her prom dress. Um, in the book, it's red. And she keeps saying, I might have thought it was red um, because she can't, she can't differentiate between. Eve being the fall of man and her, her own daughter. Um, so they become absolutely synonymous. Um, Margaret, after Carrie gets her period and she asks her why she never told her about it, uh, Margaret begins to beat her, um, threaten her for her transgression. Um, and this is kind of where we start to see the first signs of her telekinetic powers. Um, uh, but Carrie's adolescent body at this point becomes the site upon which monster and victim converge. And we are encouraged to postulate that a monster resides within her. And that's kind of a, that, um, that quote is kind of a, a theme that happens throughout the book and all of the films actually. Um, <clears throat> uh, some authors believe that Carrie's powers were a result of her period, um, further, further proving her, her own monstrosity. 
Um, but actually in the 2013 version um, and in, in Stephen King's book, um, they address that this is actually a genetic, a genetic ability um, and there's a whole network of women that actually possess it. Um, and I think the 2013 version, it kind of handles that more delicately than the 1974 version of it. In 74, she's monstrous and just for monstrosity's sake. Um, whereas I think there's more empathy that you find to have with Carrie for in the 2013 version. And I don't know if that's because the director, Kimberly Pierce, is queer. Um, but I do think that that might have a lot to do with the perspective of who's making it. Um, in the 1974 film, Carrie seems unaware of her capabilities and they occur in small eruptions, um, mostly at times of vulnerability or anger. Um, Carrie's telekinetic power is used almost like a shield or a layer of protection from the constant torture and abuse she receives from her mother and from her peers. For instance, um, when the light bulb explodes in the shower scene after she's tormented by the women in the locker room, um, and then she's slapped by the gym teacher um, for her hysterics, she blows the light bulb, but she doesn't realize that that's her doing it at the time. Um, she, it even begins to act as a manifestation of her rage, um, basically, for basically speaking for her when she can't. Um, and there's a scene in the 1974 version where the principal keeps getting her name wrong. Um, I think he keeps calling her Cassie um, and he's trying to console her for what the women did to her in the locker room, but he keeps calling her Cassie and she keeps correcting him and he doesn't take him, he doesn't even listen. Um, and something at that point goes flying across the room when she becomes really angry and she says her name quite like sternly. Um, it's, it's not, it doesn't seem like her powers at this point are a connection, are an extension of herself. She doesn't seem to have much control of, over it. Um, but in the 2013 version, um, Carrie becomes aware of her ability early on in the film and begins to nurture her skills um, instead of it kind of have, happening haphazardly and kind of causing fear in Carrie. Um, while, it manifests, while it manifests itself when she feels pain or rage, she often never uses it to harm anyone. This becomes evident in the scene where her mother is begging and berating her not to go to prom. Um, while she loses some control, uh, everything, including her mother in the room, lifts and falls quite suddenly. Um, she doesn't intend to hurt her mother. She actually <clears throat> looks shocked at what she's capable of. Uh, in the end, she uses her powers to lock her mother in a closet and leaves to go meet her for, for her prom date, um, but, not before with, but not before turning on her mother's favorite Christian radio station um, before leaving. Uh, Carrie's powers actually are an extension of herself in this, in this kind of version of Carrie, in the 2013 version. Um, and it's evident in how she uses it in comparison to the 1976 version. It gives the audience time to sympathize with Carrie as both the victim and the villain, unlike the 1974 version, where she becomes the epitome of a female monster. Uh, in this one, she is gifted but abused, so how can you blame her? Um, In the end of the book and the films, Margaret reaches, um, well, I guess, I think you guys know the ending of the film. <laughs> uh, basically, Carrie has a Lady Macbeth moment after she goes through the prom and kind of kills everybody that she knows um, and burns the town down. She goes back to her mother's house where she kind of feels safe, but she's more of like a, a victim going back to her abuser, um, which is quite sad. Uh, and the way they portray it in the 1976 version. Um, but she has this moment in the bathtub where she cleanses herself and puts on a white gown to prove that she's not evil and she's quite pure. Um, but in the end, um, Margaret White reaches for a classic slasher knife to kill her own daughter, which is recognized in the final, which is recognized as in the final girl world um, as a phallic weapon. So um, we learn here that Mrs. White um, um, we learned here that Mrs. White is kind of racked by her own fermenting sexuality as her de desire explodes in an immensely phallic display. Um, at, the, at this point, Margaret doesn't know that what Carrie had done to the town um, or her high school, but in her mind, Carrie is the representation of all that is evil. Um, in both films, Carrie kills her mother out of protection but she never picks up the knife herself. In the 2013 version, you see the, 
the remorse as she holds her mother's body and forces it to rain stones on her house, killing herself with it. Um, looking at the elements of the final girl formula and the iconography of death, I see a lot of correlations with Carrie. Um, Carrie's character isn't feminine, isn't very feminine, and in the book is described as a bigger girl with a lot of acne, um, which is not exactly the female lead that 70s directors at the time would want to portray, I guess. Um, she was quite subdued in her dress, um, like a final girl might be. It isn't until she gets ready for prom uh, that she begins to play with makeup, clothing, and her hair, all elements of what she thinks femininity entails. Um, as we know, Carrie ultimately becomes the bringer of death, or death itself, uh, but this is not unlike the images we saw in the decadent era of death imagery, where they were hiding who they actually were, kind of hiding the monstrosity underneath. Um, scenes where Carrie tests shades of lipstick in a drugstore and applies makeup the night of prom are similarly framed through the girl's mirror reflection, altering us to the fact that Carrie's femininity is a surface alteration designed to mask the true horror of her own body. Um, but I think that's the correlation that I see with that in the decadent era, I think is really, really strong. Um, Cause there's no other really final girl that kind of masks herself that I can think of um, that masks herself to be more feminine in order to survive. I don't see that actually happening quite a lot. Um, so uh, famously at the end of the book in both the films, Carrie acts much like the death imagery we see in the medieval era. I think a lot of you know the end, um, but the, basically one of the popular girls dumps a bucket of blood on Carrie when she is uh, crowned prom queen. Um, and she goes berserk. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, she kind of becomes um, enraged after she starts listening to the thoughts of her mother saying they're all gonna laugh at you um, over and over and over again. Um, so this fills her with so much rage that she actually uses her powers to lock the doors and terrorize her peers um, and eventually her mother and the town. Um, she burns the school behind her in her wake. Um, but in the 2013 version of this, I think the 76 version is really indicative to what Stephen King kind of felt about women anyway, which is really like kind of coincides with what was going on in the medieval era with like this Monstr monstrous death just killing anything that came into its path. Um, it's more like chaotic. Um, and I think that's why that carry is so iconic. I think it was like the first time that anyone's seen real pure feminine rage in a film and still be rooting for her. I think that didn't really happen very often. Um, and I think that that is addressed in the 2013 version um, with Kimberly Pierce um, because the when Carrie starts to um, lock the doors and starts to go kind of nuts. It's only when one of the buckets of blood falls on her prom date's head, Tommy, um, and he dies. Um, so it's not out of rage um, and revenge. It's really about injustice, I think. Um, however, in both the films, it becomes a purging moment for, for both Carries, both versions of the Carrie. It's She's purging everybody, uh, much like the death, death that we witness on the carriage. Um, as Clover says, uh, the women's liberation movement has given many things to popular culture. One of its main donations to horror, I think, is the image of an angry woman, a woman so angry that she can be imagined as a credible perpetrator. Um, I stress credible, of the kind of violence of which in low mythic universe, the status of full protagonist rests. So, um, yeah, I think that that's, Carrie's such a strong, she's not necessarily a final girl. She does die at the end um, and she's not really following that kind of formula. But I think that her vulnerability, trying to keep her alive for as long as possible is really kind of beautiful when at the same time um, in films in the seventies and eighties, like most women weren't afforded that luxury. They weren't even afforded that amount of screen time to be vulnerable and emotional. Um, and even if at the end of it, her emotion is pure, unadulterated rage. I still think that's kind of beautiful, good for her, um, which kind of leads me um, into the next film that I want to talk about, which is Midsummer. Um, and I wanted to talk about this honestly because I think this is a kind of a trend that we're seeing uh, in horror films in terms of how women are depicted. Um, to me, she's probably the final girl that I wanted to see growing up. 
um, but never really got to experience it within mainstream horror. Uh, so yeah, I'm just gonna like lead into that. Um, a lot of people view this movie as a protagonist, uh, as the female protagonist release from a toxic relationship. Um, and I think in my mind, it's more about healing and trauma um, and grief. Uh, yeah, I think it's more about those three elements um, than it really is about. I know like it's the surface level is that toxic relationship she has with Christian, but I think really it's all the stuff that happens between their interactions with each other that I think are really important. Um, so basically, um, if you've never seen it, the film follows a dysfunctional couple, Danny and Christian, as they travel to Sweden with a group of friends for a midsummer festival, um, only to find themselves in the clutches of a sinister Scandinavian pa uh, pagan cult. Um, I would like to point out that this film doesn't actually really follow the final girl formula um, that you would be anticipating, which I think is really interesting. It's not most of the movie occurs in the broad daylight, which is um, actually kind of more un unnerving than if it was in like this enveloping dark location. Um, and I think that's a really, um, it adds the un uneasiness. And I think that was a really smart call by Ari Aster, the director. Um, as for the female prot protagonist, uh, she never really claims, um, she never really claims that monstrous woman motif um, and her trajectory is very, very different. Uh, than most final girls. Uh, we also know that most final girls must endure trauma throughout the duration of the film, um, usually spread out between different deaths of her friends or family. Um, but Danny's traumatic event actually occurs with, within like the first like 20 minutes of the film by the loss of her family. Um, and I think this part is really interesting uh, the way it's filmed, I think, is really important. Um, but basically, uh, Danny's character gets a message from her sister, who's bipolar, and it's quite ominous. Um, and she's she's afraid that she might hurt her mother and father and herself. Um, and as the viewer, we know that that would probably happen. Um, and in fact, it does. Um, but Danny doesn't find them. It's not that she stumbles upon the bodies. It's actually the viewer and the audience that do that. Um, so she's not really forced to witness the gruesome murder like other final girls are, um, usually have to. Um, we as the audience are the ones who find the bodies. We're the ones, the camera pans through like in first person and stalks through this dark and empty house to find them. Um, and it's almost as if we're looking for the, for the victims. It's, it's quite an interesting um, take on that. It, it's really similar to um, the killer in Halloween, I think. Um, even when thinking of the deaths that happen within the community, uh, Danny isn't the one who finds them. Um, we, uh, as the viewer, know um, that they suffer, but Danny doesn't really see, doesn't see it very much. Um, I think it's also really important to take note that um, when we're looking about, when we're talking about uh, women that die early on in the film or kind of those sub characters that die and how it's usually always gruesome in this particular film that doesn't really happen the only death that you see really up close is when there's a the ritual happens with the two elderly uh couple that jump off the cliff and the one that gets bludgeoned to death actually isn't the woman and it's the man and that happens up close but danny's character actually doesn't witness it she actually runs off before that happens um so i think that's i think it's a particular there's a reason for that, like while that happens, it's almost as if he doesn't want to give into that sadovoyeuristic kind of view um, that most people go to see horror films for. Um, he almost just doesn't want to give it to them. Um, even if we look at the way Danny is dressed uh, throughout the film, it, she deviates from the final girl quite a bit. Um, she starts off quite masculine or understated fashion and becomes more feminine as the film goes on. Um, and she gets more involved with, the, as she gets more involved with the cult, she becomes more feminine and kind of takes on a little bit of that personality. Unlike Carrie, I don't find this to be a part of a masking performance of femininity. Um, I think it occurs as Danny starts to heal throughout the film, as she becomes a little bit more comfortable with her own emotions throughout the film. And that is, I forgot the title, but that is um, the girl from Texas Chainsaw Massacre.
uh, number two, or her name is Stretch. Again, loves a button up those final girls. Um, so Danny is never exposed throughout the film like many of the women. Um, oh, as she's uh, talking about as she's dressed, sorry, I got distracted. Um, talking about how, how she's dressed, she's um, like a lot of other women in horror films, especially in like, we're looking at like 80s, 90s um, and 70s. There's a lot more women that are more exposed in it. And you do have that one scene where it's like that sex fertility ritual um, where everybody's naked, but it's not in, it's not in that, in the same sense that uh, it was used as a plot device in like 80s films and stuff. Um, and I thought it was really interesting that even Jack Rayner, who plays Christian in the film, wanted to be naked so he could understand what it felt like to be vulnerable, um, which I thought was a really interesting way of putting it. But I guess in comparison to other horror films, that would be the case. More women would be nude more longer um, on screen than men would. Um, so I think his quote here when he in the conversation with the LA Times is, is kind of an interesting take on that. Um, for the most part, Danny isn't really focused on anything else other than trying to suppress her own emotions. Um, struggling to find comfort in her own partner, she stifles her grief and her unhappiness um, throughout the entire film. While she seems bothered uh, by her con while he seems bothered by her constant upset, I believe that Danny is reacting appropriately to the situations that she's in, um, including the one where uh, with the the elder couple that jumps off the thing, she's the only person that has like an, a normal health reaction to that. Everybody else is kind of just staring at it. And because he's trying to look at it through an anthropological standpoint, so are all of his friends. No one's reacting in the way that they she was like, why isn't anyone reacting like this? And I think that's that's a really great moment that not a lot of final girls get to have um, in horror films. Um, she continues to have these outbursts of emotion throughout the film that cause her to run off from the group. Um, and in most cases in horror films, we know when you get separated from the group, that is a one-way ticket to Slaughterville. So it's, uh, you're kind of always expecting that throughout the entire film where you're expecting to see somebody behind her and. Um, when she's looking in a mirror or anything like that, but it actually doesn't happen that way um, for her, which is uh, just a really great deviation because he's, again, Ari Aster as a uh, director, I don't think is giving what he, what the people want or what they thought they wanted in terms of like horror films, since that's what people come for. They think it's quite predictable. And I think in a lot of ways he tried to avoid all that. Um, but yeah, um, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, even in terms of death iconography, there isn't a correlation to death and Danny in the ways that um, she is seen as the aggressor or even evil. Um, towards the end of the film, Danny is asked to join a ritual where the women must dance in circles until they fall. Um, the last woman standing becomes the May Queen. Um, so we have here, um, I find these scenes to be more closely related to the dance of the macabre um, or the dance of death. It is in these scenes where death dances with members of the community so that it's more lighthearted and more of a lighthearted and fun death. Um, there, there are passages of writing where it says when death comes calling, the best you can do is dance with it. Um, so I think that these are more closely related um, than any other sort of like evil imagery um, of death. And in fact, these, this kind of imagery, there, death isn't even gendered. Um, while Danny is reluctant to join at first, she ultimately wins the title of the May Queen um, and in a sense kind of becomes death. Um, this is during the climax of the film. Uh, uh, this, at the climax of the film. Sorry, sorry. Oh, just to uh, make you aware of the time, we're at 6.02, just so you know, um, if you maybe have a few slides you could rush through a little bit, that'd be great. So yeah, yeah, this is the last one. Oh, perfect. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, uh, this is the climax of the film. Christian and Danny are both drugged and Christian joins a sex fertility ritual with one of the younger girls in the community. After Danny wins May Queen, she is brought to the house where she is forced to bear witness to his infidelity. Um, she completely is overwhelmed with emotion and yet she never has her carry moment, not in the way that you want her to have it. Um, she becomes this evil, hideous, vengeful monster that we know of. 
she doesn't become that evil, hideous, uh, vengeful monster. Um, once we are, once we get to kind of the last festival of uh, the Hargan community, um, it, the festival entails uh, that they must do a ritual sacrifice of nine human beings. Um, four must come from the community and four must be outsiders and one will be chosen by the May Queen herself. Um, unlike other final girls um, who must claw and fight their way to survival, Danny's life doesn't seem to be hanging in the balance at all. Um, oftentimes we see final girls must kill or be killed, but for Danny, she is given a choice of who to kill and she gets to keep her own life at the end. Um, and she has a choice between choosing her, a member of the, the community who is actually willing to go and her boyfriend. And in the very end, she has the autonomy to get to choose who lives and who dies and she chooses her boyfriend anyway. Um, I think she still ultimately is that victim hero, but she, unlike Carrie and the Bride of Frankenstein, she doesn't die at the end. Um, you actually don't know what will happen to her at the end. Um, so it's, she, it's just the fact that she had autonomy to choose um, who gets to live and who gets to die and no other final girl has ever been granted that kind of, um, uh, that kind of practice, so. Um, but ultimately, I'm, I'm sorry I kind of rushed through some stuff. I got a little bit nervous about time. Um, but ultimately, these are the three films I feel like just really drive home the good for her kind of cinematic universe that I'm in love with. Um, but I also see it correlate so much with uh, death imagery. And I think it's important that we know that these exist because the way femininity is portrayed is kind of a reflection of how we, we think and look about um, femininity as a whole, as a culture. Um, and I'm really interested to see what would happen, what's gonna happen now that we're kind of deviating from this old school kind of final girl kind of thought process of filmmaking. So thank you guys. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, that was really interesting. Um, I also love the, the historical overview um, that you gave, that was really great. Um, okay, so if everyone, if people have questions, please, now's the time. Uh, we have a bit of time, like 20 minutes or so. So, um, yeah, let us know. Um, I can start off with a question that I had. Um, you know, really, uh, it's interesting that you kind of chose, um, in a way, unconventional final girls, as you mentioned, uh, some that were not actually final girls. And, and Danny, as you said, is kind of non traditional. So I'm wondering in your mind, uh, how useful is, is Carol Clover's like rigid kind of definition these days or in your understanding of, of horror? Of oh, I'm sorry, say that last part again. How, how useful is Carol Clover's term, you know, um, for you, for how your understanding of, of horror? Um, I, so I, I think now it's changed so much, but I do think that understanding where she's coming from, cause she wrote that I think in the nineties. And I think at that point you had movies like Scream kind of being really hyper aware of what horror was meant to look like. Um, I do think she, it gives you kind of like a good foundation of what the final girl was. Um, and that is like kind of a great jumping off point from there, which is why I think, I think what's more fascinating to me is that it's actually really not that far from how we've viewed death throughout time. Um, and I think those are so closely related. And all of it is a reflection of how we feel about the women in the time that it's in. Um, so I think where that has a purpose, I think for me now, I like to look at that as like, this is what it used to be. Um, and I can't wait to like kind of push forward and move past it kind of a thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, uh, we have a question here. Uh, Rebecca McCollum, I believe. Um, do you think that the monstrosizing of Carrie is a commentary on society's discomfort at the notion of a powerful woman? Yeah, I think it depends. I think, um, like it depends on the film. I think the 2013 version is a really good, that I, I think that's for me, that one's more of like a good for her, I would have done it too. Cause she, there's more, um, there's more empathy towards her. Um, that I think in the other one. The other one, she just becomes a monster like almost instantly after getting her period. And I do think that is a reflection of how we view like women uh, or how they like how women were viewed at the time and that they are quite monstrous. But I think in 2013, there's, a, there's more empathy involved. I don't know if anyone's ever seen it. 
Um, and also Carrie too, right? Which you, uh... <laughs> I haven't watched Carrie two okay. all the way through. <laughs> there are so many versions of Carrie. I yeah. the musical though it blows my mind. It didn't. It opened for one night and they canceled it. <laughs> um, okay, next question by Jose Miguel Martinez. Um, what do you think of the race aspect of Midsommar? Danny's whiteness seems crucial to her survival and what is a pretty textual racist cult cult mm -hmm, indeed. Yeah, um, I, I think horror for the most part, even now is still kind of whitewashed anyway. And I think I, I addressed it in like in the beginning of my talk because I was really like, I mean, final girls are always white. That's, that's always how it has been. I, I know that there's a ton of people that are kind of starting to take that and, and change it a lot just now in the modern day, but like, like cult classic horror films are always white and all, almost every character that really gets to live is white. And I do think that that is a problem even in Midsummer. Um, and I really wish that that wasn't the case. Uh, even like, I mean, that whole movie is white. Like the clothing is so white, like it's just very whitewashed itself. And I do, I do regret that that is even a factor that keeps her alive. I wish that it wasn't even a part of it. Hmm. I think it's also kind of an instance of like an othering gaze on whiteness in a way, like this kind of weird sect that are, uh, is still white. Yeah. I think it, would, it would be read very differently if this was not a white cult. Yeah, anyway, So that's true as well. Um, okay, any other questions? I'm gonna chime in with a question over here. Um, I took some notes at, at the very beginning, you mentioned death as a nurse, a lover, a friend and a gardener. Yeah, and that was super intriguing, and I love that you have these references to art history throughout to back that up. And then I was just thinking, looking at this picture of Danny in the corner in her flower suit, this feels like some garden imagery that yeah. might relate to this kind of like uh, this tension between like death and like the flourishing of of life in a garden. So I'm just curious to hear more about if you have any further thoughts on this particular gardener death imagery and its um, history. I, the gardener is the first time I've ever really seen that when I was collecting images for this like talk. I, I've never seen death specifically as a gardener um, and it's not really mentioned very often in, at least in the sources that I've come up with. Um, I think more, more, um, I think that death having um, the site, the, um, that image of death is actually more closely related to farmers because it probably stems from a society that is more agriculturally based. Um, and like I said, when not involved with religion, then it's no gender is needed, kind of. There's no point to make, death is metaphysical. So um, it's never something specifically as a gardener until I found that painting and I think it is the most wholesome thing I've ever seen. <laughs> um, but yeah, as, as for Danny too, I think, I think her being covered in flowers and that idea of flourishing, I think it's, she had her moment of purging, like she watched and burn and all this other stuff. Um, she had kind of a carry moment, but not in this monstrous way. And then she got to kind of flourish afterwards. It was more of like a cleansing. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. That's really fascinating. It's giving me a lot to think about. Thank you. Yeah. Going into this, also this death symbolism, someone asks, how about death as the innocent virgin? That's I haven't seen many um, virginal deaths. Okay, maybe. I mean, I, I would, I'd be happy to look at some of it or like, see some of it because I, so that sounds fascinating. The, the quote by Edgar Allan Poe. What, that, uh, the like, yeah. everyone loves a, a dead woman? Is that, um, <laughs> that something, cool? something virginal, I believe. Um, maybe, again, the no, question asked sorry, I, more specifically. Sorry, I couldn't post the quote, but by Edgar Allan Poe that I wanted to post, it was uh, something along the lines uh, that there is no no other more romantic topic than the death of a young woman. Yeah, that, I, I think that kind of happened around the decadent era 
And that was because it was really fashionable to look dead because so many people were getting tuberculosis um, and other like kind of diseases that made them look pale. Um, and like women were actually kind of striving for that anyway. And there, there's a whole, um, I skipped the romantic era because it was it very similarly, it's death is a friend, but also like how great is death? Like everyone was so into death and it was almost contemporary and fashionable to be dead. And I think that there are a couple of quotes um, that even some directors have said something similar. And I think that that is so ingrained in our psyche from like kind of late 1800s to now. Um, I, I think it's John Carpenter says uh, something like, I, I know what they want. Like there's nothing better than a dead woman, like a woman being gruesomely murdered than maybe a hundred more women being gruesomely murdered. I have to look for the quote, but he basically was saying, I do this on purpose. Like I want more women to die. And I think that's what the people want. And that's so, that quote comes up all the time when I'm like doing research for this stuff. And it does, it is kind of ingrained in our psyche a little bit. Is there any other? Uh, another question coming up? Um... There's someone raising her hand, Paulina. You can unmute yourself if you'd like. Oh, let, me, let me first get the question and then. Uh, Hi, Paulina. Okay, never mind. Hello, I'm sorry I was late to your talk, but thank you for your masterful handle of the topic. And I don't know <laughs> if you already <laughs> mentioned this, um, but um, all these films are seem to be all like directed by male uh, directors. And um, and like they have like a maybe a male gaze of like femininity or like the characters and like the virginal or whatever. So I was wondering if uh, there are, you stumble upon any like female directed uh, versions of the Final Girl. Mm. Um, I recently watched T Titan or Titan. Yeah, yeah. I haven't. I don't, watched like, I don't. I don't think. I, I don't know if that's like. Uh, a final girl per se, but like it's directed by women, it's like body horror. And I thought that was like really interesting to watch uh, how like this representation of like women horror by women. Mm. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you have any recommendations for films to watch um, that are directed by females. And maybe you said already, but I was late, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one of the Carrie, films um, and it was so poorly reviewed uh, was the 2013 version that was done by Kimberly Price and she did the same movie um, I think it's uh, Big Girls Don't Cry or Boys Don't Cry that's one Boys Don't Cry um, she did that film and she had won an award for it and then the next film she was given money to do was this Carrie and she had been turned down like multiple times by other companies to actually make it happen um, but, and she is the only person that like, I think her, I think her kind of style of this, of this carry is so interesting because where the 76, I think his name is De Palma is the one that made that one, where there was blood, she was like, put more blood, add more, let's go worse. And I, I think that is really, really great of her to do. Um, and she does that throughout the entire film. Like the guy, Tommy, her prom date is really nice in the, in the 70s version. She was like, make him nicer, make it hard to kill him. Like she really, and she just made it so exaggerated, um, almost like kind of making fun of the original Carrie a little bit and like how women were portrayed in that film. But I think for, in terms of other female uh, led horror films, I think maybe the hosts would be a better option. You guys might have great suggestions. I mean, you know, there we have so many films that we show that are uh, play with these kind of tropes, I guess you could say. Um, I would recommend, I mean, I don't know, right now I can't think of uh, many <laughs> offhand, but- um, I just did Prevenge in there, into yeah, the chat. Exactly. Prevenge, um, um, yeah, anyway, so many. Uh, so I would um, recommend maybe looking at our program on our website. Uh, look at our previous um, years, and uh, there's plenty there. Um, yeah, we're in a good good era for that right now. Um, okay, another question. Um, in her text, uh, Clover is critical of the feminist potential in The Final Girl. 
do you think this has changed with contemporary representations of final girls or of the final girl? Yeah, I think so. I think, I think now that it's getting a little bit more diverse up in that genre, I think that is really helping the, the evolution of the, uh, the final girl a little bit. Because it's not, it isn't just, isn't so male dominated anymore. Um, it's also not very straight cis white male dominated anymore either. So I think that's really like, I think that's why her work is kind of dated. I think I use a lot of her quotes because it just gave you like a good solid definition of what I was going to be talking about. Um, but I do think it has evolved since, since her writing. Okay, we have time for like one or two more questions. Um, can you talk about the portrayal of death in contemporary art? Yeah, yeah. what do you want to know? Maybe how it's changed, you know, um, since uh, I guess you, the decadent era. Yeah, uh, well, images of death uh, from decadent era to like the 1900s, like uh, early 1900s are pretty similar. Um, I think I mentioned uh, in the talk that in this time is when you start to see like the angel of death, um, the, the nymph kind of like this ethereal death um, and that becomes quite popular, but nothing, like I said, nothing was more popular. I think that has stuck out as much as the femme fatale. Um, I think now images of death, I think a lot of contemporary artists are, are doing um, interesting things with death and grief. Um, I know, She's not very popular, uh, but I know Tracy Emin has done a lot with death and grief that I think has always been really interesting. And I think um, there are some artists that just do it poorly, like um, Damien Hirst does a lot of, bored of him. But um, yeah, I think now, I don't, it's hard to say because I'm in, I'm in this era now and it's hard for me to kind of like look back on it. But I think a lot of um, death when religion isn't even involved, um, when it's more of like a personal experience uh, for like smaller villages or smaller, like uh, smaller groups of people. Um, death seems to be about how the person dies. So you would see a lot of images of death that was, if it was a child, it was a nurse. It was more like loving, more nurturing and less scary. Um, and I think it's, I'd probably have to look into the politics of the era and, in like the decades um, from the decadent era till now and seeing how that reflects it because it's all very, very intertwined with each other. And now I don't really know what contemporary death would look like. Um, and I think that's probably why I keep doing the research that I'm doing because I'd love to know what, what contemporary death would be personified as. I don't know if anybody has any ideas, but that would be, that to me is fascinating. Because I don't, in this, in, in my mind, at this point in time, I don't even think gender will be involved. Do you know what I mean? I have a question, um, something following up on something you had mentioned earlier and said that you would go into in the Q&A actually, oh, yeah. um, is the, the connection between like the, the sexlessness of the final girl and the HIV AIDS epidemic. Mm. Um, I would just love to hear a little bit more about that. Okay. I, I know we don't have a lot of time and I'm going to try and like, because it, it is, it's kind of fascinating. Um, so horror films in the 70s in, in America kind of reflected um, the fear of the women's liberation movement, but also this kind of fear of turning away from God. So you had like movies like Rosemary's Baby, The Omen, and it was all about these promiscuous women, not promiscuous women, but um, this is what, this will be the birth of what happens if you don't follow God. So you had the omen and stuff like that. And that was more of like a polite nudge um, to kind of, oh, we're getting too far, we're getting too far. And I think um, in the, well, not I think, but in the eighties, that polite nudge stopped happening when the AIDS epidemic happened. And because there were so many misconceptions on how, how people were contracting AIDS that they didn't know anything, they just associated it with sex. So the polite nudge became an overt, like if you have sex, you will die. Um, there's a lot of text about it that I could probably send you that I think is really in, like interest that you might like. Um, but basically it just, it was all surrounding the preconcept, like the misconceptions of, um, of the AIDS epidemic and how it was being handled. And I think there is actually one of the directors 
of Friday the 13th, one of the ones like where he went goes to space or something like that. It was like one of those really far out ones. I think he, um, I'll have to look up his name, but he was a gay man. And he actually did a podcast talking about it. I'll have to find all that information for you, but um, I hope that helps a little bit. It's totally. If there's any, if there are any resources or links or articles you want to share after the talk and you, you can forward those to us and we can make them available. Yeah. If anyone's interested in it, I'd be happy to give everything I've, I've been looking at. Cool. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Well, if there's no other question, um, yeah, I'd like to thank you again, Taryn, uh, for this really illuminating talk. Um, and again, uh, welcome people to donate to us if they feel like here's the link again, uh, the PayPal link. Um, and yeah, this is just the beginning of our Brain Binge event weekend. Um, Sarah, if you'd like to talk about our next, just to introduce it a little, maybe, our next talk. Yeah, we have a talk coming up at seven. Let me pull up the effect of it. Not here. It is called I Am She, The Witch Archetype and Patriarchal Disruption. Um, and the speaker will be Tori Potenza, who I know is here right now as well. And then at nine o'clock, we have our third talk of the day, which is Inner Hauntings, Memories, Visions, and Haunted Houses in Women-Led Horror Films by Kate Robertson. So that'll be today at nine. Tomorrow we have three more talks. You can find all the info for those on the Final Girls Berlin Facebook and Instagram and website. So yeah, we really want to thank you again, Taryn, for this. This was yeah. so fascinating. Thank you so much. I'm sorry that I I like Not at I got so overwhelmed with all the information. <laughs> of course. No, you, you reduced it well. It was <laughs> thanks guys. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Thank yeah, and please much. also feel free to reach out to us with feedback or I'm sure Taryn, I guess you're also okay with being contacted by yeah here. So the dialogue can Instagram, continue. Maybe you'd like to Yeah, uh, my Instagram name is Arts and Whiskey. I can put it in the chat. Um I'll do that now. Um that's probably the easiest way to contact me right now. I'm trying to work on not having a separate email, not like a personal one, but I haven't done that yet. So um, but yeah, that's probably the best way at the moment. So if you guys want any sources or anything like that, just let me know. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We'll see you Thank all you after in, in about a half hour. Our next talk will begin. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. I don't know how to turn it off. I can't help. How do I get out of here? I will get out of here.